Hello everyone. It's another sunny Friday here in Valencia and we are back with another episode of the Ivory Road podcast. My name is Dermot Kavanagh. Here with me again today, we can't get rid of him these days. Paco, how are you doing? Hello everyone, really good. Yeah, finally it's sunny. We had a few bad days, but now really happy to be here. <laughs> Summer is coming. And today we are delighted to be joined by Manuel Kekin, manager at Accenture, where he leads intelligent automation practice. Manuel, one of the key members of Ivory Road, how are you doing? Fine, thanks. Uh, finally, we have the chance to do a, a podcast all together, so I'm really happy. Are you at the headquarters of Tesla? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm in a digital environment. <laughs> so, <laughs> as you may have guessed from Manuel's background, today we are going to be talking about artificial intelligence. So, Let's get right down to it. Manuel, do you want to give us a little bit of background on artificial intelligence? Maybe explain to us how we use it in our day-to-day -day lives. Yes, I would like to also give a, a really short definition of what is it uh, artificial intelligence. So when we are talking about uh, artificial intelligence, we are talking also about uh, computer science. And the artificial intelligence is all the art, let's say, to replicate the human brain. This, what does it mean? It doesn't mean that we are able, together, thanks to the artificial intelligence, to replicate the activity that normally a person can do. So this means either we can handle, let's say, very simple activities that are, let's say, with a require a, a few cognitive uh, uh, skills from the artificial intelligence, but we are also able to do very complex activity, high and very difficult decision point to take. So I would say regarding to your question that we can see artificial intelligence, uh, basically we have two perspectives. The first one is uh, like a user, and the second one is like, uh, let's say a worker. Like a user, I mean, uh, we just uh, need to have a, a, a smartphone and you can realize that the artificial in intelligence is something pervasive. It's all around us uh, right now. Uh, this means that often I think you, you were able to see maybe uh, some services of Google's that are already able to uh, predict uh, or to forecast uh, your interest based on the type of persona they were able to map. This means that based on the, your age, some type of data, your age, your gender, and so on, and your previous choice, they are able to forecast what are your current interest. This is, uh, let's say, uh, can give you a, a little idea, perspective of what artificial intelligence is. It's basically uh, analyzing data and being able to build up a pattern, to find out a pattern and that is going to allow you to define the, the decision. Then you give feedback, what happens. That uh, Also on Google, sometimes it suggests you a certain search, but then you ended up to do uh, another one different. So at that uh, time, you are going to give a, a negative feedback that the Google is able to receive it and understand it and learn from it. So maybe the next time is going to be more accurate, either with you and either with a persona, personas uh, like you. And apart from this, let's say um, in the work, the second topic I was saying is the work. So artificial intelligence, since it is able to replicate the activity of the, the, of the person, one of the biggest fears that we are encountering is that we are, we are afraid that the, the bot, the robot are going to, uh, let's say, take our jobs. Let's say it's not properly like this. For sure, this is a, a, a topic that maybe later on we are going to dig in. But I feel like the artificial intelligence and generally speaking, all the automation uh, technologies are not taking uh, uh, over our jobs, are just shifting us to other type of activities. 
So maybe certain type of activities, they are going to handle them, but then we, are, we have to be able to do, to upskill ourselves and to shift to different activities. We have to think about what we say, uh, a sort of a augmentation, like human plus machine working together. And we are, we are able, let's say, to do more and more compared to what we were doing, let's say, back in the days. But I would add just one, uh, another, uh, let's say, topic. Um, I mean, when we talk about artificial intelligence, normally we, we think it's something in the future. What I can tell you is that uh, artificial intelligence is reality. As I, I told you, you, you can see in your normal day-to-day -day life, it's already inside. And also from the work perspective, let's say all the CEOs, CFOs that we have been, uh, we as Accenture have been interviewing, they say that for sure is a priority. And uh, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, all of them are already trying to do small pilot uh, about these new technologies. What I can tell you on the other hand is that we have 80 to 85% of uh, our client that are stuck in the digital transformation pro, uh, uh, journey. Uh, they are stuck basically because they, they are just doing this kind of pilot and they don't leverage on the full uh, automation potential of the artificial intelligence. And with this, I mean, as I already said, we are going to shift how we are currently work. So it means that we have to completely change the way we work. So this for a firm means to change the organizational structure, change uh, like the, uh, the processes, uh, change all the activities. So it's something um, that is really complex. And uh, right now, what I can see personally is that like the, the firms uh, are, uh, let's say a little bit, they, they see this kind of project uh, as a risk, but uh, I, I'm sure that in the near future is something that is going to be required to them to change completely the, the activity. Perfect. So this for me is just to give a, let's say a little outlook uh, of the artificial intelligence. So. Perfect. So following on from one of the, one of the strands. So Manuel, you, you raised the point that we need to look at things from two perspectives, the users and the workers. So Paco, if we focus on the workers for a minute, can you give us a bit of the historical context to the development of AI and also just the development of people losing their jobs to machines or people fearing that they're gonna become inadequate in the labor force? Yes, definitely. Um, so I will start like, yeah, by saying that, uh, of course, the, the question of unemployment due to technology has always been there uh, when the wheel was invented. But as a real problem, as a modern problem, was started to basically be discussed uh, in the, uh, at the beginning of the 19th century. Uh, David Ricardo is probably the first uh, economist who talked about it. But in a, a traditional economy, with traditional economy, I mean uh, classic economy, where you know the, the idea was that uh, the market, if left to itself, will create the best condition, so will absorb the maximum number of uh, people in the job market. This is the classic economy. So unemployment is not a real phenomenon. Uh, in the traditional vision, uh, which I would say, pre, well, I would call pre-Keynesian, unemployment was due to either laziness or uh, well, stupidity, something like that. <laughs> like, so the unemployed people were considered uh, simply people who were not good enough to uh, enter the job market or who were lazy, uh, alcoholics. There was all, uh, uh, so it basically was considered something for lower classes because they were not good, uh, good enough. And I think part of this mentality stick to us, unfortunately was recovered. And there is still, still this idea that a lot of people now are losing their job because they are not good enough. Mm -hmm. What changed our perspective? Uh, two things. First of all, the Great Depression in 1930s, 1929, 
Uh, now, the Great Depression is the first real big systematic systemic crisis of capitalism. It started with the fall of the uh, a crash of the stock market in the U.S., but enlarged to the uh, entire economy and uh, caused for the first time mass unemployment uh, in most countries, especially in the U.S., but then affected uh, Europe as well. And in many ways can be seen, you know, all the disruption and unemployment can be seen as one of the causes, for example, of the rise of uh, Nazism, uh, fascism, and all sorts of extremist movements, uh, um, political movements. Now, analyzing this crisis, so uh, Minor Keynes, who is the father of modern economy, uh, starts and says, like, it's not true at all that capitalism creates this perfect equilibrium and the best um, conditions for people, at least extreme capitalism without state intervention. What actually creates is unemployment, is disruption, because this process of uh, technological innovation will cause the loss of uh, jobs and will cause uh, uh, that only people with capital, basically, it, this is also a little bit of um, the point of Marx, you know, like he's saying, like you need to compete with your with another person. I'm an entrepreneur, you're an entrepreneur. Where I do compete, the cost of labor is similar. The cost of uh, the um, primary um, matter is the same of the, the thing we need to build. Yeah, equipment and stuff. Equipment and stuff. Where I compete is technology. So where I can cut the cost is technology. So I'm forced to innovate with technology and then to cut the, 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 the wage of my um, employee, basically. So minor case starts from this and says, actually, capitalism creates this condition where uh, technology uh, creates unemployment. So the state needs to intervene in the economy by managing of the aggregate demand, which means basically creating jobs mm -hmm. and uh, uh, absorb this unemployment. So yeah, 1930s, uh, 1936 is Keynes' general theory is when we start to um, address this problem. Now Keynes, this is really interesting, wrote uh, uh, a saying in 1930 with the horizon to 2030. And uh, uh, he um, basically he imagined that we would have worked in 2030, so he has still uh, um, nine years to be right, that we would have worked uh, 15 hours per week or three hours per day. This is what uh, Keynes um, used to see, and it was, this was his uh, forecast. And uh, I think we are not too far from this. So there is, I think there is, uh, of course, I'm here, uh, while Manuel is more here to talk about the technical question, I'm here to talk a little bit about the political and economic question. I think um, there is a big shift. Uh, I agree with Manuel, this, this change is not going to be as some people portray it as there is no work anymore. Mm -hmm. In fact, like uh, only 5% of the job I read, um, if you look at the McKinsey study, by 2030, so the horizon of discussion right now is 2030, it makes no sense to make, you know, to talk about further uh, in the future because things are changing so fast that 2030 is what we can think about. And they were saying only 5% of current jobs can be fully automatable by 2030. So 5% is not, still a big number, but it's not that big. Mm -hmm. What will happen though, is that about 50% of the jobs uh, can be cut uh, like to um, like basically 30% of what you do in a job today can be automate, automated. So it's not that there won't be job anymore, is the total quantity of job, 30% is a massive That's difference. Huge. Like you miss one third of the time you spend working is not necessary anymore. And so I think uh, uh, what we need to do now is to rethink a society where, as Manuel was saying, our work change, but also our work-life balance changes. So a different society, in a way, shifting towards slowly a post-capitalist society in many terms, or a, now the word is not important, but a different, more human, uh, humanistic, I would say, type of uh, capitalism. Perfect.
That was really, really insightful, Paco. It kind of ties into to one of the main topics we want to discuss today, which is this document that got leaked this week. So the document was first, um, first reported on by Politico, and it's essentially a draft of the regulation that the EU is preparing to, to regulate and to police um, artificial intelligence. Now, the main focus that the EU are trying to take with this regulation is they want to be human centric. Okay, so we've seen how AI works in China. They have a social scoring system. It's absolutely barbaric as far as I'm concerned. You've got AI in America, which is just like most things in America. Corporations do whatever you want and we'll look over there. So let's, let's look at some of, the, some of the key points from this document. Manuel, did you have a chance to, to look at the, the points and what... what um, what points jump out at you as being the most interesting or even maybe the most controversial, let's say? I mean, the point here is, uh, I, I read a little the, the document uh, mm -hmm. very quickly, to be honest, <laughs> but uh, I think here, let's say scoping the automation is like one, uh, one issue for sure. Mm -hmm. Because at a certain point, it's even difficult to, to con uh, let's say to control. I mean, also yeah, another certain kind of pitfall um, with uh, I mean other pitfalls uh, with uh, artificial intelligence are that I see are basically these two. The first one at a certain point, basic we are using uh, artificial intelligence because it. Uh, it is able to see patterns that we are not able to see. It is able to suggest the insight that we are not able to see. But then this can trigger to some problems also, no? Because maybe uh, you already know uh, about the very first uh, Facebook uh, problem, no? With the chatbot, when the chatbot uh, actually were very useful because you can chat and they were like uh, answering to you. But at a certain point, they start to, to interact between each other, between chatbot, and they build up uh, a new languages that we were actually not able to understand. So these are kind of stuff that a little bit scares me yeah. and needs like to be, uh, let's say, verified. Uh, I mean, scoped. And then uh, on the other end, uh, I was saying uh, mm, uh, another pitfalls of the the e AI is uh, okay. I just lost it. Uh, I, I had it in my mind, but I just lost it. Um, so are you saying that there is going to be a robot revolution? Like, do we need to fear, be ready to fight? <laughs> uh, no, 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 no. The, the, I mean, this is just something that we are. Uh, we can joke on on this, but then I, I mean the the other point we can we can face is basic. Ah, oh, okay, I got it. Uh, I would add another pitfalls, but for one is the knowledge transfer, because if we keep on giving, I mean the bot is going to do what we actually are doing right now. How we are able in the next future to control the bot? Is if he's doing. I mean, we are to keep the knowledge how, of how to do the stuff, you know, because if it is automatic, uh, like think about with uh, the, the pocket calculator, no? I mean, this is a really easy example, but if you keep on using the pocket calculator, in the end, you are going to forget how to do the simple math, you know? And it's the same thing with the artificial intelligence. I mean, if you let them all doing all your job in the end, you're going to forget this. And so this is going to be for sure a, a certain problem, uh, you know, in, uh, in, in, uh, in, in, in maintaining and maintaining and controlling the, the AI. So these are two stuff that I see for sure. Mm -hmm. And uh, on, on the Manuel, other hand- Manuel, sorry, just on that point where you're talking about like the calculator as an example. If we look at education at the moment, are these problems already present? Because let's say you have kids in school now, okay, of course you use a calculator in school for doing math, that's not a problem. 
But every phone now and every Gmail, all this stuff, it has predictive text. It shows you the words you want to write. It spells yeah. them for you. Are kids already forgetting how to spell in schools, do we think? Do you think that's the case? I mean, this is, a, a, again, this is either a good and a, and a bad thing because sometimes it prevents the kids to learn uh, some older stuff uh, by heart, you know. And sometimes I think we all have been passed through this kind of maybe stupid stuff. No, right now they can just Google it or so on, also a formula, and they just focus on understanding when they need to use the specific formula and how to use it you know they don't need to remember these like uh, 20 characters formula and so on on the other hand as you were saying i mean if there's someone always suggests me the, the right thing i maybe forget how to spell it how to do it how to derive the the formula and so on these are for sure some problems and uh, i mean in you highlight a very important topic that for me is like the uh, the education. The education needs to change strongly in terms of giving new skills and new capabilities to the student, but must be able either to uh, maintain the knowledge, uh, the previous knowledge, but also to give like uh, also some humanistic uh, subject in the schools. Even if right now we all always talk about the stems, uh, we talk about how it is important right now, the coding, the, the, ma the math, the statistics and so on, for sure, that is for sure. But in the end, we, in my opinion, we need to really have the, um, the capabilities of the philosophy, of the literature, in order to understand all of the humanitarian and also to be able to question the ethical uh, question mark about the automation. Generally speaking, as was also Paco saying. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned the, the ethical side of things there, Manuel, because maybe we can focus in on this for a minute. Um, I'll come to you in just in one minute, Paco, but just for anyone who's, who's listening or watching and maybe didn't get to see this document, some of the key, the key points contained in it, well, this is from an ethical point of view anyway, I'll give you the, the human rights perspective, is that in certain cases, police can use facial recognition technology. Now, of course, the example they give is for terrorism. No one's going to complain about facial recognition being used to find a potential terrorist who's committed a crime. But let's talk a bit about how dangerous it is, things like um, facial recognition, particularly for protesters, because we've seen new bill, a new bill being passed in Britain. And with this regulation coming in, events happening in the United States, Paco, are we losing our fundamental right to protest in the light of these sort of advances in technology? Well. The risk is concrete, I think it's really concrete. Um, as you said, uh, I see a few countries where there are really big problems. China, of course, is one of them. Uh, ranking system, uh, as you were saying, such a, such a ranking system and scoring system is incredible. Like, just to explain to uh, our listener, basically, citizens are buying artificial intelligence, uh, evaluated. Uh, they basically get a score if they are good citizen or bad citizen and they get surveilled to, through artificial intelligence and even punished and the rest so it's a basically a black mirror kind of scenario there's an actual black mirror episode that exact scenario is basically <laughs> that yeah exactly but is, china is not the only problem which is problematic as you were mentioning the uk changed a lot of laws in the period that i was here uh, yeah. for five, six years, the, the privacy sort of, and the kind of data the government could get from you um, increased so much. Of course, they use sort of terrorism as an excuse, I would say, uh, if you allow me that, because the risk of terrorism was never that big to justify this violation of privacy. If there is one state which was the first to start this, where the US, you know, after 9-11, mm -hmm. again, also their risk of terrorism really low, um, you know, Dick Cheney, basically uh, the vice president of the U.S., started this giant uh, reform of the American system, where basically 
they had almost dictatorial powers to violate citizen freedom and citizen um, privacy and citizen rights, just if there was a suspect of terrorism, you know, analyzing uh, phone calls, even before the AI, um, checking their, even the, like just arresting people uh, with just for suspicion. And uh, there are even cases of torture. Now, now the question is different now, because with AI, the level of uh, surveillance you can be subject to is incredible. London used to be, I don't know now, but a few years ago used to be the city with mo the highest number of cameras. And during a day, just going to work and coming back, you are basically in, in thousands of cameras. So the level of control and artificial intelligence can exercise by face recognition only is incredible. Yeah, it's terrifying. Um, like another, one of the other points in this in this document is that um, so they want to they want to exclude artificial intelligence that can endanger people's safety. Obviously, you know, self driving cars, um, but other ethical issues like judiciary decisions credit ratings, job applications, and included in this article, they mention any artificial intelligence that can endanger the EU's democratic process. Let's talk about how big of an issue this is for the moment, because we all know what happened in the US last year. The amount of misinformation that was spread and most importantly believed during the presidential campaign was pretty terrifying. You know, there were still uh, Trump supporters up until last month who thought Trump was going to be the president in March. Do you see this as a big threat to to our democracy, Paco? No, yeah, well, definitely. I mean, the, the, in general, the question, of course, artificial intelligence attaches, I would say, to the question of data and of the level of um, control you can exercise on people by giving them the wrong information. So there is all a different aspect of uh, fake news as, as well that uh, we need to um, we need to check is of course a really difficult question the same as with terrorism like there is a balance I would say that we need to find and I think is the goal of this document the European Union is trying to exercise between security and control uh, like so wh where there is a security let's say for example now you know if you write something about COVID or something which is about the, the American election you know there was a point where Twitter, if I'm not wrong, shut down Trump's account. Yeah, he's now, gone. He's banned forever. Now, Trump in that period was a criminal, in my opinion. He was a coup d'etat because we, there are a lot of euphemism, but was an attempted. Uh, well, he was at least a demagogue leader, like. Well, but even more, like you know, there were people in the uh, Capitol Hill that. Yeah. With, with weapons and all the rest, like this is not something that can happen in a democratic country, you know? So I, I think, of course, could be justified from a certain point of view, but at the same time, a private um, company, Twitter, which is one of the main source of information for a lot of people, shutting down the still, at that moment, president of the United States is something that is almost, uh, you know, uh, fantascientific, like sort of a, 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 almost a, a dystopian reality in a, to a certain extent. So I think it's a difficult balance between the two things. Between control, though, and security, I prefer, um, uh, sorry, freedom, let's say, and security, I prefer freedom to a certain extent because, you know, the risks, again, the risk of terrorism are serious, but the risk I see of control if they can access to your information, I think are way, way higher. Yeah, I mean, it, at the end of the day, we've had, okay, 9-11 changed the world. It, I mean, that will, it will never unchange since 9-11. That was the huge, the, the one that kind of woke up the world to this idea of, of terrorism. Um, there haven't been that many terrorist events in the last 20 years, you know? Whereas the idea of the of people surveying you all the time, if you ever want to go and protest anything, if you have a problem with some violation of rights and all of a sudden they're seeing your face at protests before you do anything, before even if you even if you had the intention or the the, the plan of doing something against uh, public safety or whatever, 
it shouldn't be a preemptive uh, availability for the government to, to be tracking people like that, you know? So, Manuel, we're, we're kind of coming towards the end of our time here, but can you just tell us in your own opinion, oh, wait, sorry, before we get onto that, what about sustainability with AI? This is something I wanted to ask you, Manuel, because I'm, I'm pretty uneducated on the topic. But when I started to dig into AI, I realized sustainability needs to be pretty central to, to every new advancement. How do those two topics link? I mean, I, this, I, I would say about, uh, I would talk about sustainability, generally speaking, when it comes to technology. Mm -hmm. So as we saw during this COVID, for sure, this is going to prevent and help us like to be more sustainable because uh, it gives us the total freedom to work uh, when, wherever we want to without going to, to the office properly. So uh, it, for sure, like technology allows you to be more, let's say, sort of green. The point about this uh, um, is also, it depends on the, I mean, wh when it comes to technology, it comes to infrastructure. And then when it comes to the infrastructure in order for them to work, you need energy. And the, for them, all about this, it's going to be, let's say how you uh, build up this energy. So to me, uh, it's important and crucial that right now all the big tech company are going to go green for sure, because they are going to have all these big servers, all this huge warehouse where maintaining all the, our data and, uh, um, and all the machines and, and they need for sure to be, let's say, more green. At a certain point, if I'm not wrong, uh, right now, Microsoft, for example, is like uh, installing all the, uh, all the servers under the ocean because in that way it's going to be easier and uh, le also less expensive to freeze them. Uh, but on the other end, I'm always questioning this about the, the sea life, how it's going to impact, to be honest. So on that point, uh, I mean, it's crucial on the sustainability part, uh, for, for sure to, to go green on this. And then on the other one, I mean, is going for sure on our uh, on our day to day life. It give us the chance to let's say waste less food, for example, because maybe we can have some um, artificial intelligence also on our fridge. So maybe it's going to well organize and suggesting us what we should eat and something like this. And also we are is going for example to. Uh, reducing the waste, reducing also the energy, reduce because it's, it's going to be able to well adapt the recognizing when we need exact, exactly the energy or the uh, other, I don't know, or the heater or something like that, no? So in this case for us, it for sure can help, but we must be consistent either in when we are building this new technology, we we need to um, we need to be I mean consistent in in be green you know because otherwise it's going to give uh, like some uh, help in in one field yeah. but on the other one is going to be even worse. Uh, on the other hand, I was like thinking about I mean I'm always questioning and I'm not an expert. I give uh, if it is possible I ask a question to Paco because at least according to me. I, I remember we also had the chance to talk about this also together with the former Italian president, uh, Dalema, in Cambridge, but uh, the topic is still huge, uh, at least uh, to me. I mean, like uh, you were talking about the, in the Industrial Revolution, and I do agree together with you, but at least on my mind, it seems, it seems that uh, at that time, it was kind of easy for these people to shift their skills um, to other. I know, I don't know. Uh, early, they were working in a in a farm, and then they had to go in inside a, 
uh, a firm, no? but it was kind of easy no? for the, to, to shift this kind of skills. Right now, I think that like uh, they need to upskill and, and it's not going to be easy for everyone to do something like this. I know because a certain one thing is doing data entry, one thing is like uh, uh, interpreting the data entry, analyzing data and so on. And I do not think that is something that everybody can do, to be honest. So at this point, uh, do you think like the, some new measure as a universal basic income or me, me, maybe reducing uh, in a very high way the uh, hours and days that we work uh, per week is something that we have to do or not? So, well, definitely, I would say, like, in the sense of... Uh, um... Paco, before you answer, can you just explain to people what the idea of universal basic income is? Just to be clear. Uh, yeah, definitely. Well, the universal, the universal basic income actually uh, originated in the liberal um, thought. It's more a right-wing idea than left-wing that nowadays is considered um, both on both sides, but like uh, starts from the idea of uh, everyone having uh, uh, an income as a citizen, basically. Now, there are different ways of doing it. Like it doesn't mean that everyone needs to be necessarily uh, a wage, uh, but is actually connected with this idea of unemployment and of technology to giving a basic wage, which allows you to you know, satisfy your basic human needs. The, at the time of beverage would have been called the freedom from want. So like uh, the idea that you uh, don't have to suffer from not having food and not having the, the, a place where to live and all this. Um, I would say that I was saying that it developed in the right field mainly because uh, on the left the idea is way more like about you know redistributing um, the all the wealth we have and sort of the, the idea of a little bit working less but working everyone so uh, a more egalitarian uh, distribution. Why this is a bit of a right point of view in a, in a way because they are just saying you know. I get rich and okay, so that you don't make a revolution, I will give you uh, um, a, little bit. A, yeah, a little bit so that you can survive and you don't uh, kill me, basically. You know? <laughs> uh, so the difference between uh, the current stage, so there are a lot of parallels between the 1930s, I would say, uh, and 1940s and now. There was a big crisis, uh, that there was another shock, which was World War II, in this case is the pandemic, it's completely different, but still we are in front of two, really big shocks and uh, you know crises are always moments of change Winston Churchill used to say never waste a, a good crisis in the sense that there are periods where it's possible to make changes that would have been unthinkable till recently like for example now we're all to a certain extent doing remote working and probably this is going to be the future only five years ago if you talked about remote working at least in Italy at least with most but in the UK as well uh, most of the entrepreneurs, they would have said that that was impossible, that that was a crazy idea and uh, um, all of this. As Manu, I, I would attach to what you were, we were saying about instruction on the quest to answer Manuel's question. Like, uh, so I think we need to rethink society and instruction, not anymore as a period of your life. You know, we have still this, I think, old idea of education as the first 20 years of your life, let's say 20 something, if you have university and whatever. And to think about education as a lifelong process. So where you need, need and want, because it's a, a wonderful thing, not learning uh, thing, things, uh, new things to keep on studying and uh, upskilling yourself. In, of course, I think there, are, uh, the, there is a point in what you were saying. We need a bit of more of a, I would we call it Leonardo uh, kind of uh, uh, education. Uh, Leonardo da Vinci, I refer to Leonardo da Vinci, who was you know, a great inventor, a great artist, and he was a philosopher, but at the same time a scientist. Uh, he was the first to theorize certain, even claims to a certain extent, and uh, the bicycle, for example, uh, years before. <laughs> All this happened 
And at the same time, he was a great artist, so uh, in process of uh, humanitarian uh, education. I think we are in the condition to change the mentality and because we will have more free time and because we need to upskill in a lot of time in a lot of things the state needs to give us will need soon to give us the possibility to become a more 360 degree kind of human beings so certain coding skill will be necessary for everyone but also you know deep diving in like the 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 you the incredible richness of human thought and human history and human philosophy is something that is necessary for every one of us i think so th this is my answer you have welfare yes universal basic income but not that much in the sense of you stay at home uh, and you know whatever in the sense you have freedom to do whatever you want but they will give you the resources to become a more ri a richer human being and a richer person and a more complete person Paco, just one last quick one because we're we're running out of time. But on this uh, this topic of upskilling and retraining, how do we deal with this with the older section of the population? Let's say if you're over the age of fifty, because in most countries in Western Europe we also have a a really aging population. You know, we've got the pension time bomb, as they call it, coming, where countries are talking about increasing the retirement age because there isn't enough money to pay all the people who want to retire. How is this going to work if people hit, let's say, 50, 55, they have to reskill and retrain? How is yes. this going to so work? So I agree with uh, well, Manuel brought a really good article for Brew Road on this. Uh, I think it's a mix. Uh, 50s and 60s, if you are 50 or if you're 60, is not the same. Talking at least with my parents uh, who are uh, in the late 50s uh, and beginning of 60s, uh, I, I, my impression is that they would gladly <laughs> leave the job market and you know spend the last 20 30 years of their life uh, or hopefully more like even 50 60 uh, but uh, traveling and seeing the world and reading and you know they In the manual suggest is really important. Are you getting me here? No, I missed it, that. I missed that Paco. Sorry, could you repeat it? There was some technical issue. Yeah, no, I was saying that my, like, so the, the, when you are in your 60s, probably you are thinking more about you no know, uh, going on holidays and studying and perhaps seeing the world. Like you worked hard for the rest of your life. Now, perhaps you, uh, you're happy to leave the job market. It, for the, but there is so a, a gray area in between. I think what Manuel was saying is important uh, the, in the, the article that we can use this, you know, the experience and the, uh, there is not only technical, but it's leadership, a lot of other skills uh, these people have. So they can, for example, uh, have a role of management of the personnel, of helping the young generation to understand the facets of the world perhaps working uh, uh, less hours, but in uh, positions of uh, um, basically leadership. Uh, I think that that is potentially one uh, one of the solution. Of course, then it depends on uh, single cases. What do you think, Manuel? Yeah, I, I do agree with you also because I wrote in the article, so yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's something that we, uh, is something that we need to address. This for sure is my perspective and yours, Paco, but uh, as a society, it's something that we need to address. And again, it still underlines that uh, uh, also in the education, in order to address this problem, STEM cells for sure important subjects, re really relevant, but we need also to maintain the importance of the humanitarian uh, subjects because all of this stuff is really, really important in order to question this because right now we are in the, in the phase that we are trying to do, trying to implement uh, uh, this new technology, but at a certain point the ethical questions uh, and, this, and the impact on the society is going to come up and we must be ready because otherwise we, we are going to be like uh, to question this stuff when it's too late and we don't want to do this. Definitely. That's perfect.
All right, guys, I think we're going to leave it there for, for this morning. That was a really interesting chat. Manuel, thanks a million for joining us. It was a pleasure. Thank you so much, guys. Looking forward to do a, another one together with you. Absolutely. Paco, a pleasure as always. Yeah, thank you. And so much. Myself and Paco, if, he, if he's happy for more podcasts, we'll be back on Monday for a little bit of a news update. And until then, have a nice weekend. Oh, and next week, uh, sorry, announcement. Oh, big uh, one next week. Yeah, we will yeah. have uh, uh, Lorenzo Marsili, uh, really important Italian philosopher uh, and a member of uh, DM25, uh, who uh, will join basically. And uh, so stay uh, updated and follow us uh, for next Friday. Perfect. Thanks, guys. Have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you.